It's your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Good to be here with you, folks. Excited to get into this stuff this morning, man. Um, you know, yeah, the Lord has just really just been ministering to me out of out of this book. You know, not only this book, but really the whole of the scripture. And, you know, I was talking to a young man on the streets last night. And, uh, you know, he came up and kind of one of those typical, you know, grabbed his necklace kind of thing and starts to show you his, his pendant. You know, we've all probably had that happen. Well, it happens that this time, the, the pendant that he was flashing or, you know, showing me as he was kind of nodding and, you know, like we're on the same team kind of thing. And I looked at it and I, I didn't really recognize it. it. It wasn't a cross. And so obviously out there on the streets, a little bit kind of dark, you know, and then already having to wear glasses. I, I, I assumed it was a Catholic trinket of some sort and, you know, a saint. And I just couldn't see what it was. And and he's kind of nodding his head. And I said, you know, walked over. Hey, man, what, what is that? Talk, you know, and asked him what it was. He's like, this is Saint. I don't remember who he said Saint. It was a saint I never heard of. I, I guess there's a lot of them. I don't know. Dad, you grew up Catholic. It was like a million different saints. And, and so I'm assuming all the apostles are actual saints, but then they just started adding people as time went on. So I, I didn't recognize the name that he said. And he said, hey, this is Saint so-and-so. And I said, well, what about Jesus? And he says, well, and it is an interesting statement because, you know, he, he said something. And I don't think he meant to say this because he backed up on it later, but he said, this is my God. You know, and it was just really interesting. And it kind of stopped me in my tracks. I never had anybody say that. And, uh, and I said, say, I was like, I was like, well, man, the Bible says, you know, the first commandment is to have no other gods before, before him. And he's like, what? He's like, I, you know, and he started to stumble over his words. And he's like, what? No, I'm just saying this is, you know, like I'm Catholic. <laughs> and then he just blew it up. And I said, well, man, I said, bro, I said, the, you know, the problem is, you know, when we get to heaven, there's not going to be Catholic or Baptist or Methodist, Presbyterian. There's going to be born again and not born again. You know, and, and so I was able to share with him the gospel of, you know, that we have to be born again. And so as I began to preach that to him and share that with him, you could just, I mean, his eyes were just opened up, you know, and he was genuine. He didn't try to fight me on it from that point on. And I said, man, you, you got to get into the word yourself. I said, you know, he's like, well, I'm, you know, he's in medical school. And I said, well, if you spend time reading these books, if you're spending time to learn these things for your profession, I said, how much more for your spiritual well-being? I said, you got to you gotta read the word, you know, and so I just really challenged him on that. I said, hey, look, man, I'm not, I'm not here to, to beat a confession out of you or to get you to pledge to me that you're going to do these things. I said, this is between you and God. And it's a serious matter. I'm just really encouraging you to, you know, don't waste your opinion or your thoughts based upon other things that you've seen and uh, get into the word yourself. And so, you know, it was just a, a quick witness. And I, I think he received that said he had a little bit of an issue with the fact that the Bible was written by men. Once again, I said, well, if you're going to college and paying thousands of dollars for, to learn stuff that was written by men. I said, why don't you get into the word of God and test it for yourself? And so really got to minister to him on that, just believing God will do a work in this young man's life. His name was Victor. Oddly enough, that's my brother's name. And, um, and so, but yeah, once again, studying the words for ourselves so we can show ourselves approved. So obviously it applied to victory last night on the streets, but it still applies to us. And so I'm excited. I get excited when I get to study and get into the word of God, because I know it's going to have a product in our lives. It's designed to grow our faith. It's always designed. Faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God. Amen. And so that's not different. That's never different for any of us. If we get into God's word, it's always going to get into us. Amen. And so back into first Peter, we're in verse three today, and it, man, this is just a really, really good one. I think this is going to bless all of us this morning as we really just start to unpack a lot of, um, you know, just the, the deeper things, the ministry that Peter is really laying for us here through his, his epistle. And he says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He says, all praise, and this is out of the NLT version, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How much praise? All praise. <laughs> he says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by his great mercy that we've now been born again. I'm telling you what, man, this, I get excited just reading this one verse. It's because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we can live with great expectation. I mean, man, as I started to read this, I was like, whoo, I started reading it over and over again. Just getting, I mean, just riled up and excited and, and just... Man, I mean, just supercharged by 
the word of God? Is is he really Peter is a, a, exhorting us, you know, to to the worship of God and the understanding of what he's done. He's really laying this out there for us. I don't think he wants to leave any gray area for the church that's out there, you know. Uh, number one, who, we're, who, who we serve and what he's done for us. Amen. And so he says, all praise to God, the Father. And so the opening statement acknowledges, number one, the sovereignty. And then number two, the fatherhood of God. And so I talked about the sovereignty of God, in, I think, in great detail through the, the Beatitudes study. But essentially, God's sovereignty is just his, his rule over everything. His perfect rule over everything, regardless of what we see in the natural God is still sovereign. And so it's difficult to understand through the carnal nature because it's a spiritual thing. <laughs> I was talking to another person on the streets last night about that. Well, I, you know, I'm a, I believe, but, but there's always these buts because they don't see, you know what I mean? And so seeing isn't believing, amen? We believe and then he shows us, he see, we see things. We can only see spiritual things after we believe, right? Now, we can get glimpses into the supernatural. I know I had a ton of them before I really got right with the Lord, but they were always demonic. Anybody ever been there? It wasn't good stuff. Amen. But once I believed upon him, then I was able to see into the godly realm. He started to show me things. He started to unfold things because now I had spiritual eyes that were opening. Amen. And so this, this opening statement, once again, acknowledges God's sovereignty, that he's working regardless of what we see, how we feel, what we're going through. God is sovereign over those things. What this does is it really lays a foundation for, for a, a fruitful growth in the faith. We get saved by a revelation of God's truth, and we stay saved by a revelation of the truth. Amen? He says, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Another wording of that is the truth will make you free, which implies a continual process that God is constantly revealing more to us. As he reveals more, we get a better stride, so to speak, right? We, we're, we're walking with more confidence because his truth is continually revealing him to us. Amen? And so God is sovereign over everything. You know, if, if you haven't had a revelation of that, then I would press into the Lord and ask him for that. Lord, help me to understand that you're in control. I know you say, hey, preacher, I know it's, it's you say these things, you know, but it's, it's harder, you know, it's easier said than done. I, I get it. I totally get it. Amen. I mean, I'm a human being, <laughs> almost 50 years old. I've lived plenty of life and have had plenty of times where I thought that God was in control of everybody else's life except for mine. Amen. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, he's still faithful. Amen. If we, we repent, this is where we, we get his mind and we come back to his precepts and his truth. His truth will continue to bring us back to that place and make us free. He's sovereign over everything, folks. He's doing, he's doing what he desires to do in our lives as long as we continue to offer them as a living sacrifice to him. He's going to continue. His will, will, will be done. Amen. And so this opening statement acknowledges, number one, his sovereignty and his fatherhood. The fatherhood of God. And this is something we're going to talk about uh, in, in a little bit of detail going through this, this verse. Just the fatherhood. And this really kind of is, is giving us, you know, the, um, the, the layout for the Trinity as well. And so we obviously, I don't think there's a person in here that can look around. I don't know, maybe Austin over here that, you know, that we're, that's not a Trinitarian. I think we all are. <laughs> we all believe in the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, right? If we don't, see me after class. <laughs> And so I like these, the way that he writes, because this automatically, you know, it, it puts God the Father in a, in, a, in a role as the Father. And then he says, you know, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's, but there's people out there that, that do not believe in the Trinity. And so, but he's laying that foundation here that there is a Father, there is a Son. We know there is a Holy Ghost, you know, um, different variations of Christianity and different other cultish, you know, beliefs that you know, Jesus is a creative, created being. He's not actually from God. He's just you know, a, a, another created, just a little bit higher than the angels kind of thing. Well, that's not the case. Jesus is with the Father. The Father is with Jesus, amen? And there's plenty of scriptures to back that up. But he's, he's saying those things as this is just matter of fact. This is the way it is. He's not arguing those things, and I like that. This is a fact. Jesus is God. He's from God, amen? And so... So it's going to lay a foundation for the fatherhood of God. And, and this is really praising God, praising the Father for his role in salvation through Christ. And so he's praising God for his role of salvation that came through Christ. So he, he's acknowledging the whole picture, so to speak. 
you know, and it's just really, I think, telling of where Peter was at this time and his understanding of salvation. I mean, he, he, he has gotten a revelation. You know, one time he was with Jesus there, literally walking, and, and they couldn't see, you know, but time has passed. I mean, he's matured in the faith. He's understanding that, man, this is a plan that has been laid a long time in advance, amen? And so Peter's emphasizing the relationship between God, the Father, and Jesus, highlighting the authority and the plan of God in the redemptive work that came through the cross. And so he's highlighting two things. Number one, authority and God's plan. Now, we're going to get into a decent amount of talk, really, about authority, because I believe this is, you know, a, a debated issue, it, you know, just amongst Christianity and, and other religions, just this, the, the concept of authority and how that plays out through the religious structure that is Christianity. Amen. And so think about Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, when we're thinking about the plan of salvation, the authority of God through the redemptive work of Christ. Look what Paul says in this. He says, wherefore, wherefore God has exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To who? To the glory of God the Father. Amen. And so Jesus has gotten a name above any other given name, but listen to where the glory goes. The glory always goes back to who? To God the Father. Amen. And so all praise, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, to God the Father. And so we see a continuity in this, amen, that even Jesus in himself and his ministry always pointed everything back to God the Father. Once again, laying some, laying the foundation or really the structure of authority. You know, I, I love how that was there in, in, in Paul's epistle, in Peter's epistle, and in Jesus's ministry itself. And I think it's important because we live in a very, you know, anti-authority culture, right? We don't want... We don't really care for a chain of command these days. But listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. I'll read this to you. Now, this is Jesus, that, once again, showing us how this chain of command works. So Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. Amen. He's giving glory to God the Father. You've given him what? authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this, if you ever want to know what eternal life is, highlight this one. And this is eternal life that they may know you and the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work that you've given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had before the world began. And so once again, there's a chain of command here. And all glory is going back to God the Father. And Jesus set that precedent for us. Amen. So, but we obviously, I believe, and I know, I think we all believe in this room, that we're not worshiping two separate gods. It is one God. Amen. And so I'm not going to get into that discussion today, but Jesus is God. He's God in the flesh, amen? But he's still showing us kind of how things are going to work for the ministry that was following once he was to ascend to heaven, that there's always going to be an authoritarian chain, and it comes from God the Father, amen? It's an important thing to understand because that breaks down into what we're going to get into a little bit later, which is just our personal lives and our, our households, amen? Because we all have natural fathers as well. And so first, we want to look at what, what Peter was saying in the beginning of this verse. He says, all praise to God the Father. So I want to talk a little bit about praise <clears throat> because I believe the praise is a powerful thing, a powerful weapon in our lives that we can use to combat really all the issues of life and the biggest issue in our life, which is really ourselves, <laughs> right? The battle against the flesh. I think praise is one of the biggest weapons that we have against the battle of self and our flesh. And so praise itself, there's a lot of different variations of the word that is used for praise in the scriptures. And I don't know if this is on YouTube, but it might be. <clears throat> Excuse me. A couple years back, um, Sister Holly had done a, a 
a, a teaching on, on praise and worship. And she really broke down all the Hebrew words that are used for the word praise and, and what they mean and how they're applied in all the various Psalms. It was really, really interesting. So praise can mean a lot of things when it comes to the outward expression. But essentially, it's, it's a few things, and I'll tell you what they are. First, praise is essentially refers to lifting up, lifting up the Lord or lifting up the name of Jesus. And so that, would, that could come through song. It could come through, it could actually come through preaching the gospel. Lifting your voice up and heralding your voice is praise towards God, right? Declaring his word is praise towards God. And so in generally, it usually, it usually refers to just lifting up. Ble you know, think about Psalm 34 where he says, you know, I will bless the Lord at all times, right? I'm, or one translation says too, I'm going to praise the Lord at all times. So to bless the Lord would be to exalt his name, to lift his name up. Amen. And so this is something that really should be a habit and habitual for every believer. Amen. Amen. We should walk in an attitude of praise. But it's interesting because praise also can mean kneeling yourself down. And there's a, a Hebrew word for that that I'm not even going to try to and we get into all those discussions, but it can also mean, as it means lifting up, it also means kneeling down. And so a big part of praise is actually humbling ourselves as well. So to humble ourselves is to praise God. And we can see that even in that verse in John chapter 17, verse one through five, in Jesus's speech pattern through that, as he lifted his eyes up to heaven, but then he said, Father, you've given me everything. And he's given adoration and praise to God. He's, he's humbled himself under the authority of God the Father. And so it's interesting that just as much as praise is lifting up, it is also kneeling down. It's a humility. It's an act of humility. But it's, it is blessing the name of God. It's, it's declaring his goodness. It's declaring his, the attributes of who he is, not just what he does. I mean, so it's something that I really believe that really needs to be ingrained in the daily practice of, of every believer. I always say that, you know, when, when I'm, first married Kim, it, it was just, it, you know, we just had totally different modes of operation. And so, you know, we get married, we're on the honeymoon, we get back, we're finally start to live life, I'm going to work and those types of things, you know, and I would get up and kind of be walking around the place and I would just hear like, man, praise the Lord, man, bless the Lord, thank you, Jesus, you know, and, and I was just kind of like, because that wasn't my mode of operation. <laughs> like I prayed when I prayed and maybe sang when I sang, but I just didn't have a habit of constantly just saying those things. And so it was kind of annoying at the beginning because it was so anti the way that I, you know, <laughs> opposite of how I was. And so like, and she, you know, she wasn't quiet about it either. You know, she was like, man, praise the Lord, you know, and bless you, Jesus, you know, and she'd just be doing a random task, you know, just cleaning or sweeping. And I remember kind of looking at her and I was just thinking, I got convicted because I kind of realized that there was just like this natural, you know, um, spring, so to speak, you know, that, that belly of living water that was just flowing from her. And so it, and it really did convict me and it kind of annoyed me because <laughs> I didn't have that. And so I said, man, this is, this is just really strange. And, you know, but as time went on, as time went on, I found myself really, man, it's like, you know what, I want to I want to kind of get a little bit of this for myself. And so, you know, guess what? Over the last seven years, we've grown together in that. So now it's not uncommon to hear both of us doing things like that. You know, And so I took after her. So, you know what? If you can't beat her, I'm going to join her. <laughs> and so that's probably one of the best concessions I ever made, was just to get in the habit of just blessing the Lord and praising the Lord. And so now I'm on a job site, you know, doing my job, walking around people's houses outside and doing all these things. And it's not uncommon for a customer to peek around the corner or look out the window and just see me, you know, praising and blessing the Lord, you know. And uh, it's it's just the way that I live. Amen. It should be the way that we all live. I tell you what, it'll change your, it'll change your day. It really will. If you just substitute you know, your speech pattern for blessing the Lord, you know, just idle words, idle thoughts, and just say, you know what, man, I'm just going to bless the Lord. I'm just going to praise the Lord, you know. Well, Even if you got to do it low key sometimes, you know, understand that, you know, there's certain instances where, you, you know, if you work in a certain environment, you can't just go around shouting. But man, it really will change the way that your day, the way you live your day. Amen. Just lift up the name of Jesus. Being going to bless the Lord. Thank him for the goodness and his mercy in your life. Amen. And so praise is also... <clears throat> Part of that is it's a joyful recounting of what God has done for us. And so part of praise is, is a joyful recounting of what God has done. Amen. Is anybody joyfully recounted what the Lord has done for them? <laughs> is that, it shouldn't be very hard for most of us in here. God, I know some of these stories. Amen. And so, man, God has done a work. He's done a work. And so there should be a, 
a joy that, that is naturally growing in our life as we remember and we recount the things that God has done. Think about Psalm chapter 77, verses 11 through 12. This is a great, a great scripture. He says this, he says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I'll also meditate on all your work and talk of all your deeds. Amen. That's at the NKG version, uh, New King James Version, which I really like that one. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old and meditate on your work and talk about your deeds. Man, that is, that is the blueprint for how to verbally praise God daily, amen. <laughs> how to give him that, that joyful recounting of what he's done for us, amen. Also, Psalm 103, verse 2, you know this one. I preached the whole sermon on this. It was, a, it was a great time. If you ever if you ever need a reminder of what God's done, read Psalm 103. But here's just a, a sneak peek of that. Psalm 103, verse 2, he says this. Bless the Lord. Once again, that's praising the Lord, right? I bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. How many of you know there's a ton of benefits that go with serving Jesus? A ton of them. And he lists them all right there. He cleanses us. He heals us. He's, I mean, man, it's, it's some powerful stuff. So if you ever get into the, you know, that get stuck in a rut, feel like, man, maybe the Lord hasn't been on my side lately. Read that and it'll put you right back in check. And he's done a ton for us. Amen. <laughs> he's healed us. He's cleansed us. He's done great works in us. And so it's a joyful recounting. Now, joy is interesting because it's not just a, 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 a happy or lighthearted recounting of what God's done. It's a joyful recounting. And joy is always founded in a revelation of truth. And so it's really interesting when you get in. That's why the Bible says the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. Because joy is something that is a, a product of a revelation of truth in, in the Lord Jesus or God himself. It's a, it's a product of a, of, a, of a confidence that God is able. And so it's, it's similar to like, as I was before, like where, you know, you've ever been there on a Christmas morning and, you know, you're waiting for that gift, you know, and your folks, well, you got to go to bed and you can get it in the morning. And, but man, you can't sleep. You know, you ain't going to sleep. Just waiting for that, right? There's a joy that's built up because you're a hundred percent confident that the gift that you wanted is under that tree. You know what I mean? That's how it is when we re should reflect on what God has done. There's a joyful recounting like, man, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed with a confidence not only of what he's done, but what he's going to do that, man, I just can't sleep. I'm just, I can't wait to see what's around the corner. Amen. And, but unlike our parents, sorry, dad, we'll get out there and the gift is actually going to be there. <laughs> Cause sometimes when we were kids, you get up and it wasn't what you wanted. Amen. <laughs> it was the off brand version or something, you know, but, but God doesn't let us down. Amen. The Lord doesn't let us down. We can have a joy and a confidence. And so joy is always going to be rooted in a trust or a confidence that God is able He's done what he's already done through the cross. That should be enough for us right there. But he's going to do more, and he wants to do more. And so we can have a hopeful ex expectation or a joy that doesn't come from circumstance or, you know, enough, uh, you know, archaeological evidence. It's just founded. And, man, I've got a revelation that God is true, amen, and he's able to do what he said he's going to do. And so that allows me to walk in a, in a, in a constant praise or, or um, a joyful recounting of what he's done. Next, praise is really always going to be tethered to another word that we see throughout the scriptures, which is thanksgiving. So praise and thanksgiving will go hand in hand, really, as we thank God and we offer him appreciation for who he is. This is where I think like it, things really start to get, you know, um, a little momentum for the believers. You know, we start to walk in a little bit deeper or maturity level when we start to praise and thank God, not just for what he's done, or what we want him to do, but who he is. You know what I mean? You, you get what I'm saying? That we get start to get that revelation that, that God is love. He starts to fill those gaps and those voids in our lives that are left open from maybe unmet expectations or things not going our way. Not a, you know, there hasn't been an expediting of the plans of our lives, but God begins to fill those gaps in his spirit because he is those things. He is, he is contentment. He is peace. He is love for those who, who serve him. Amen. And so praise is always going to, you know, really be tethered to a thanksgiving of who God is. Amen. And so once we really start to get a deeper level of understanding of who he is, it's a lot harder. And because we get this on the streets all the time, maybe you maybe even got it last night. You know, somebody will walk up to you and say, well, 
So you never sin. You ever get that one? We get it all the time, right? And so, like, you know, I, I used to hate getting that one because I just didn't know how to combat that one. I was like, well, man, geez, of course, you know, man, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I wanted to punch this guy in the head yesterday, <laughs> and I lived in the TC. It was tough. Yeah. Amen. And so I would always hate when somebody would bring that up because it felt it felt like I, <laughs> I'm just gonna, like, you know, because I was, I, you know, those things I was battling through, you know, I didn't want to have to lie about it. But now I, I really welcome that, those conversations. Because I've gotten such a revelation of the Lord over the last, you know, 11 years serving him faithfully that what I always tell people was, why would I want to? You know, so I always throw that back at them. So what are you telling me you never sin? It's like, well, why would I want to? You know what I mean? And, you know, and so like, I just, you know, why, why? Why would you want to do those things? Why would you want to inflict pain upon somebody that you love? See, I've got a revelation of the love of Jesus and what, he's, what he did upon that cross. I got a revelation of the price that was paid for me. And that revelation has gotten deeper and deeper every year that's gone by in my walk with the Lord. And so, man, if, if there's anything that I understand now is that every day we have a choice, whether we are gonna walk in the flesh or we're gonna walk in the spirit. Now, do we walk flawlessly? Of course not. Do things happen? Yeah. But those things should totally become the, the exception, not the rule in our life, right? And so we're gonna pursue after holiness. And so I don't want to keep laying that foundation like the Bible tells us. It says, you know, stop laying again the foundation of repentance. Let's, let's progress on to what? To holiness. Let's move on to those things. And so, man, because I understand of, what, of who he is, it's made not sinning against him so much easier. Because you could say it like this. There's, like, there's almost like there's a face to the name now. You know what I mean? I mean, in a sense, a spiritual face to his name. Like I'm, I've gotten a revelation. I can see more of him than I could see 11 years ago. And so, man, it's really tough to just get up and say, man, today I'm just going to walk in the flesh, man. <laughs> Somebody gets in my way, they're going down, you know. It's like, I mean, man, it's like, man, no, I, but I know who God, I know who Jesus is. And as tough as this day is, I have the ability today to put on Christ and put off the flesh. Amen. You don't have to sin against God. And what helps in that is just a praise and a thanksgiving and an understanding of who he is. Amen. When we understand who he is, it makes what he's done much more valuable. Amen. <laughs> much more valuable. That God himself came off of his exalted throne, put on flesh like we have, subjected himself to the things that we were going through, was tempted in every way, yet without sin, and learned obedience through the things that he suffered, and he was faithful unto the death, even to the death of the cross. I mean, come on. Amen. <laughs> I'm telling you what, who he is will give us a greater revelation of what he's done. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. So uh, praise. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, First Chronicles 16, 34. Mm -hmm. Let me get a little, a little sip of my pep juice. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I got a Celsius and an element. Hopefully it'll hydrate me a little bit too. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for he's good. His love endures forever. Constantly praise, thanksgiving are going to be tethered together. Get in the habit, you know, make those a habit, an integral part of your day. Things will change. Praise is also, praise is the acknowledgement of the wonderful and the righteous deeds that God has done. And this is another reason why praise is important. It's simply because he's worthy of it. And so praise all praise to God the Father and His Son Jesus, simply because they're worthy. Amen. Amen. It's it's not because we we are trying to impress anybody. It's not because we're trying to check a spiritual box. If there's any reason to praise or to walk in an attitude of thanksgiving, it's simply because He's worthy of it. Amen. <laughs> once again, once we under we get a, a revelation of of His holiness, it begins to really work in our lives, and the value. His worthiness just goes through the roof. Amen. And we realize we really have no right. We really have no right to cling on to sour attitudes or, you know, the the limitations or the, um, I guess, the weaknesses of our flesh. But we can, because he's worthy, he's worthy of all of it. Amen. So we can just let go of those things. That's, you know, I think about Hebrews when he says, you know, to to uh, to put aside those besetting sins. You know, we, we, ha we have the, the crowd of witnesses to cheer us on and we understand but he is worthy. Psalms 18 verse 3 says this, 
I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Amen. So the Lord's constantly working to save us from things. Amen. He's constantly fighting the battles on our behalf. Amen. But I think about what the three Hebrew boys said facing that fiery furnace. They said, well, he may show up. He may not. Nevertheless, we're not going to bow. Amen. I say, well, God is fighting for you. Whether he shows up in this predicament or he does it, amen, he's still worthy. He's still worthy of that praise. So just let that sink in, amen. We, we're, we're obligated daily, put on the mind of Christ, humble ourselves, choose who we're going to serve that day. If for no other reason, is because he's just worthy, amen. If you don't get a result out of that day, he's still worthy, amen. So that should be a motivating factor in our, fra in our praise. And I believe Peter understood that. He says, all praise to God the Father, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he, we're going to get into this here. He's talking about the Father, and he's talking about Jesus. Amen. And so I believe this is a big deal. And why I really want to talk about fatherhood a little bit is because I really believe, and I don't. if I'm stretching, just let me know, but I believe that the enemy hates fathers. Would anybody else agree? Yeah. Amen. The enemy hates fathers. And this is why we're in such, we have such an attack on manhood, and here's another trigger word in today's woke society. That's why we have such an attack on manhood and authority, right? Because men, in, their, in the biblical sense, have a, a rightful spot in that authoritarian chain that was given by God. And so the enemy hates that. He hates the authoritarian chain at all. Amen? He hates authority, therefore... His first, I think, line of attack is always going to be towards the man. Now, obviously, the enemy you know, is like a roaring lion seeking who, anybody to devour. I know he's on the attack for everybody. But I believe that there's been a, a calculated and targeted attack on men, manhood, and the authority that is rightfully belongs to a man that has been perpetrated from the beginning and has just escalated over the past, I mean, man, I'd say 20 years for sure. You know, I mean, I, I think about... You know, even being a kid and just the downward slide that's happened in the last, you know, 30 years of my life, the way that men are portrayed, you know, in TV, movies, the media, the way that the way that they are now. I mean, forget about it. I never would have thought, you know, being a young man and seeing the uh, the heroic action films of the 80s that now, like, you know, men, men would be all deflated and totally emasculated and and really the laughing stock of every TV show you turn on. I know. I'm cool. Yeah, every movie, you know, and it's just a total, um, you know, a, a reversal of roles. Amen. And so I'm going to talk about that here in a second. But this is why I believe the enemy, he hates authority and he's sown those seeds in the lives of those of people who don't believe to continue to, to fight against authority. I think about songs from the 70s and 80s, you know, The Clash, I Fought the Law, you know, um, Breaking the Law. These are popular songs, and they, all these songs that really were most of the songs of that, that, that decade, which were all a bunch of party songs that led into the 90s and the early 2000s, were all about rebelling against authority. You've got to fight for your right to party and these types of things. And so it just set the stage for, for now, which, which at the time, you got to figure at the time, a song like that was considered borderline vulgar for radio. I mean, I mean... I tell you, I was coming back on that drive from Texas the other week, just flipping through the radio, trying to get something to catch. And some of the songs that were popping on, like, I couldn't even believe lyrically what was contained. Like, I don't know any, many of these new artists, but, I, I, you know, you say their name once, I totally forget it. But the lyrical content's insane. So stuff that was literally banned and had explicit labels or, you know, was red banned there, then is totally just mainstream now. And so all that... The breakdown of the authoritarian chain has led to this. And so society's just gotten more corrupt over time. But listen to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. Paul says this. He says, everyone must submit to what? To governing authorities. And this is why the devil hates authority. Why? For all authority comes from whom? From God. And those who are in position of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against who? God. <laughs> surprise, surprise. They're rebelling against what God has instituted. 
And guess what? According to the scripture, it says they're going to be punished. Amen. And so while obviously we're not, we're not talking about submitting to ungodly laws and authorities, but there is a chain of command that's been put into place. There's a structure that's been ordained by God that people naturally are now being just taught to hate without knowing anything about why the structure is there, who set it up, and how it's supposed to run. <laughs> and so kids are rebelling, you know, from a young age just because their parents have been rebels their whole life. And so automatically government's bad, police are bad. I mean, man, I'm telling you what, I, I can't get on, I, I clicked on one video one time on Instagram and uh, of a cop pulling somebody over. And I, I didn't realize it was a video that was actually bashing the cop, you know, and so they were, and so now I just keep getting flooded with all these, you know, cops gone wild videos of, you know, and just really demeaning the cops. And it'd be these quick, like 60 second snippets, you know, of a cop yanking somebody out of the car and doing these things. And I'm like, well, what about the rest of the video? Like, why do you pull the guy over? Like, we don't get any of that. And it's just, man, all these things kept popping up in my thread, just bashing police officers and people are loving it. I mean, it's just rolling over and over. And so there's this hatred of, of, author of authority and this God-given structure because the enemy is a, he's a, a, a being of disorder, right? God never brings disorder. And so I believe this hatred of God has been exercised by an attack on men and their God-given authority in a few ways. The first one is a distortion of gender roles. Does anybody think that's real? <laughs> There's been a, a, a real distortion of gender roles. And so really society, you know, often challenges the traditional biblical roles of men and women. It's true, but I'm just talking about men today. But society itself is challenging the traditional biblical roles of men and women by promoting the idea that gender roles are several things. And this is what the world teaches, that gender is first fluid. You ever had anybody tell you that, that they were gender fluid? I have. <laughs> and so society's attacking the traditional biblical role of men by promoting the idea that, well, that role is fluid, meaning it's unstable, right? Think about water, trying to hold water in your hand. You can't, right? Maybe a little bit, but it's gonna leak over the side of your hand. And for something to be fluid means that it's constantly moving. It's constantly changing. It's not solid, right? So think about that in the attempt to define manhood that way now. Yes. It's fluid. Well, it is, you know, it's constantly shifting. It wasn't set in stone. It wasn't supposed to be a certain way. It's constantly progressing, right? So that's the first thing that society tries to promote. Next, they try to promote, they try to tell you that it's irrelevant. You know what it means when something's irrelevant? Right. It means that really it's not, not, not valid or that it's not connected to anything. So it's, it's there, but it's kind of an isolated thing. It's not valid. It doesn't, it's not justified in this context. It's, it's without basis. Amen. Those are all kind of ways to define, to define irrelevant. And so society wants to promote the idea that manhood or fatherhood, it's irrelevant. You know, it's not, it's not really tied to any of the social issues today. Well, I'd beg to differ. Yeah. Any of us in here that ever been, you know, to the juvenile facility could probably attest to that within about five seconds, right? At the most of the issues that are plaguing the young, the young people in that place are because society is pushing this fluidity of gender roles in the household, right? I mean, it's amazing how many of these young people that we've ministered to have no idea what it means to really be a man, a father. And I'm sure you ladies could attest to the young girls not understanding what it really means to be a woman. You know, there's no solid foundation for that either. It's just moving. It's kind of however you feel. And so, man, I'm, I'm here to tell you that fatherhood, motherhood is very relevant. Amen. It's probably one of the most relevant things today that the enemy has really squashed down. And if we could institute, you know, an understanding of that and a demonstration of that back into our society, and we can have influence again in those areas. And that's what we're trying to do when we go there. And, you know, Paul said that, and I always take this, you know, scripture in heart when I'm there ministering that he says, look, we'll have, we have 10,000 teachers and instructors in Christ, but we don't have many fathers. And I believe you could say, we don't have many mothers either. We don't have many people that are willing to stand in that gap and simply parent some kids and some young people through this and help them understand who they are in Christ. Amen. And so society promotes that the, these gender roles are first fluid, 
that they're irrelevant, and then also that they're oppressive. <laughs> oppressive. You ever had anybody tell you that, man, religion is so oppressive, and that Christianity is so oppressive. You're always trying to rain on my parade. <laughs> and so oppressive, but this is what oppressive means. So if you want to if you want to say that manhood is oppressive, fatherhood is oppressive or Christianity is oppressive, this is what you would be saying that it's unjustly inflicting hardship or constraint on someone or something, especially on a minority or a lower or subordinate group. So that's what people are saying that that Christians are. Christianity is and then by extension manhood is, right? That it's oppressive, that it's unjustly afflict, afflicting you know, a, a constraint or a hardship upon somebody. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I can get into the word and all, all that Jesus has ever done is take chains off my life. <laughs> all that the authority chain in my life has ever done is lead me towards freedom. Amen. Amen. And what a lie from the devil. Amen. That, that, that manhood or that Christianity in general is oppressive. But how many people have grabbed this concept and they really run with it? They think it, you know? And so I mean, they, they, they wholeheartedly have grabbed on to, man, you know what, that they're more free by not, no, by not serving God, just doing their own thing, than they were if they came to the Lord. Man, talk about a switcheroo. Right. I mean, man, the enemy has really pulled the wool over people's eyes. Amen. And so why this is important is because it undermines the biblical teaching that men are called to do a few things. And this is what they're called to do. Number one, they're called to lead, right? They're called to protect and they're called to provide. If the enemy can thwart a man from any one of those things, then essentially he's popped one of those wheels on that tire, and while the car may continue to go forward, it's going to be a very bumpy ride, right? And at some point, the other wheels are probably going to fall off. And so anytime the enemy can inflict damage in one of those rolls in the man, he's begun to take that house down, amen? And so men are always going to be called to lead, to protect and to provide for their families. But it's within a certain context, right? It's not this, it's not an authoritarian, oppressive leadership, right? It's always gonna be based in what we would call a servant leadership. I had a friend on, well, I have a friend that I've known since junior high, and, you know, maybe, I think maybe since elementary school. And we've stayed friends on Facebook and <clears throat> she, um, you know, we were, you know, we were good friends in high school and all that. And she, she grew up Jehovah Witness. I mean, it was real terrible and just that. Now that's oppressive, <laughs> genuine oppressiveness. Came out of that, kind of got saved. I noticed for a little while, but then just totally abandoned that. And now, man, it's just, just headlong into the things of the world. She's still nice to me, though. It's, oddly enough, she's she's always you know like, hey, it's good to see you doing good and stuff like that. But she made a post a while back about um, celebrating the anniversary of her divorce. Like, man, this was great the day she got out from the authoritarian rule of her ex-husband. And so she went off on this post about how, you know, he he was so controlling and manipulating. And he would use the Bible to tell her that she needed to submit. She needed to submit. <laughs> and man, I really wanted to answer back. But you know how those Facebook threads can go. And so, uh, praise the Lord, I'm going to be in her area, which is Massachusetts, sometime at the end of the beginning of November. And I really want, I really pray that the Lord will lead a time for we can get together. I'd love to talk to her face to face. It's been a long time. But what well, we know, that's a distorted, once again, a distorted view of what the scripture actually says, right? That yes, men are to, women are to submit to their husbands, but it's all within a context. Think about Ephesians chapter five, verse 23. It says this, and it says, for the husband is what? The head of his wife. As Christ is what? head of the church. <laughs> He's the savior of the body, the church. And so if Christ came to save and he's the head that's leading us towards salvation, then by extension, it would mean that the husband is the head leading his wife towards salvation. Right? That, so that's, that doesn't sound, I mean, Jesus died to lead us that way. What does that imply that the husband would have to do? Well, the same. And he goes on to say that in the scripture as well. You know, I had a pastor tell me one time, right before I got married to Kim, and uh, he was, you know, we were going through a personal discipleship study, and I, and I said, man, you know, and I'm, I'm nervous about, you know, being able to provide. At the time, my job was 
they're still coming up in my job there at Terminex and, and I didn't have a ton of money and we had to move into this tiny little small apartment. It was literally like 600 square feet. You know, she wasn't able to work at the time and it was just rough. I said, man, I'm just really, I don't know how I'm gonna do all this, you know? And he said, brother, you only have one responsibility. I said, what's that? To get your wife to heaven. And I mean, I'll never forget that. It just, man, I'm talking like sobering. A, a quickening just came into my life. It's like, what? Because I had never thought about that. I had never thought about it in that way. That my number one responsibility, yes, I'm called to provide. Yes, I'm called to work hard. But my number one responsibility was to make sure that she gets to heaven. Because if that, if that train goes off the track, it's, it's my fault. The man is the head. The man's the leader. And I'm going to tell you, that put me in my place that day. It really did. And it kind of simplified the rest of the decisions I had to make. Because I realized, man, if I just follow Jesus first, he's going to work everything else out. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, he says this, that a man must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man can't manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? And so, once again, if the man's role is emasculated, if men are attacked and convinced that somehow their role is fluid or it's irrelevant or it's oppressive, they're going to step out of that management role in the, within the church. You know what I mean? It, I'm telling you, I, I mean, I don't have the stats to prove this, but I'd be willing to bet right now across the board in Christianity that there's more women in ministry than there are men. It's happening all over the place. Churches that my wife was a part of in South Florida, if we look into you know the, the Facebook pages and we see the people on, on Facebook that she's still friends with now, and it's the vast majority is, is women in these pastoral roles. I mean, it's, that's a whole nother, I'm not saying that women can't teach and those types of things, but I'm saying there's been a reversal and a flip of those roles. And while, I mean, praise the Lord, there's, there's genuine women out there doing the work and that are filling in those gaps, there's still men who are missing the mark by not, fill, not getting in place because they've been convinced that somehow this role is fluid. I can move on this way. It's irrelevant. Or it's, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm overbearing. I don't want to step over. And so men have lost the ability to lead with a, a humility. And so since they can't do that, they just don't lead at all. And so you have to find, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to work more. I'll just get another job. And she can do the ministry. Amen. And there's actual a couple of ladies I can think of right now that that I know of personally who are pastors and their husbands don't even have a title in the church. It's just it's a strange thing. You know what I mean? And so, but he tells us, Timothy tells us, I mean, Paul tells us through Timothy that that a man is supposed to be to manage his own household. And that's what qualifies him for taking care of the church of God. So if our house is in order, it'll help get the church in order. If, the, if there's a of a distortion of that role in the house, there's going to be a distortion of that role in the church. Amen. And so God has designed manhood. God's design for manhood is always rooted in a, I already said this, servant leadership. And another thing, sacrificial love. It's not an authoritarian control. And so men, especially in the family, are always to reflect the love of Christ that he has for his church. Always to reflect that. So if you want a, kind of a cheat sheet on you know, when you're okay to not follow somebody, just look at their lives. If they're not loving people or the body like Christ loved the church, then you're free to move on. <laughs> you're free, unless the Lord tells you to stay in that, amen? But if you're under an authority, an authority that is not loving, sacrificially loving the, the body, sacrificially loving their wives, if they're not leading, if they're not serving through leadership, then you, you're probably at the wrong church. You know what I mean? You're probably at the wrong church. And I'm telling you what, there's a ton of them out there because God's design for manhood is always going to be rooted in servant leadership and sacrificial love. Here we go on in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Here's the, here's the qualification for men to lead their house, you know, the context that my friend needed to understand. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And what did he do? He gave his life up for her. Amen. And so, yes, women are to submit to their husbands. But men are also supposed to lay their lives down. <laughs> There's a huge catch to that. <laughs> and so if we're laying our lives down, amen, then guess what? You're going to get a lot more love. You're going to get a lot more respect. You're going to get a lot more honor. Because those things are given rightfully to people who walk like Jesus walked. Amen. Just like our our praise and our worship should always go back for who he is and what he's done. 
it'll roll downhill to his leadership structure as well. Next, the attack on manhood has really produced an erosion of authority and responsibility. Once again, authority is going to be in this discussion because authority is a major theme, theme point of the devil's attack. So the attack on manhood is bringing an erosion of authority and responsibility. Two things, authority and responsibility. So there's a cultural push to diminish authority and responsibility of men, particularly in the home and in the church. So men are, you know, I've already talked about this a little bit, but men are sometimes portrayed, a lot of times portrayed, as weak, irresponsible, or totally unnecessary. Think about that. Which really can discourage men from stepping into their God-given roles. You know, I, I mean, I don't know if everybody knows, but you know, my wife and I have been, have been going through some fertility treatment. And it's really interesting because when you go into these clinics, you know, um, how, how things have kind of bent towards the, the culture. And so, you, we, you know, the first time we walk into the clinic and I pick up some of the literature that's there, you know, talking about, I mean, some wonderful stuff, talking about conception and, and just the miracle of life and what they do there. It's like, wow, this is great. But all the, the, the literature is always geared at the, the wide swab of today's culture. And what I mean by that is there's a picture of, of course, a man and a woman. And then there's a picture of a man and a man. And then there's a picture of a woman and a woman, you know, as they're making their decision to expand their family. It's, it's the craziest thing. And so what happens in this is there, there's an erosion of the authority and the responsibility and the place of men in society today. And what it does is it weakens them. It weakens them or it makes them feel what I believe a lot of this literature makes them feel like they're unnecessary. So today... A woman, two women could go and, and have a baby without a man. Well, so they say, they still got to have one key ingredient that women don't possess to make that happen. It's really interesting, right? But they don't talk about that. They talk about, well, look, look what they did. You know, and it's a really, a really sick, twisted kind of thing, but it's happening. Amen. And so what this happens is men feel unnecessary. So when they feel unnecessary, they start to live irresponsibly. I mean, man, I'm telling you, when I, when I was working at Terminex, one of the things that blew me away, now, when I finished my tenure there, I, the last year and a half that I spent there, I did inspections. And so what I did was I went to about 10 houses a day, usually, to, to inspect their house for possible termite infestation upon their annual renewal. So every time they got their bill, they got an inspection. So it was essentially just... You know, it was just fluff, really, just to make them feel better about having to pay 500 bucks a year or whatever they were paying. And so I'd walk around with a little flashlight, you know, pretend, you know, I mean, every once in a while I'd find something. But obviously, if the treatment was working, you're not supposed to find anything. But I'd walk around, nonetheless, inspect their property, you know, point out some things that maybe they need to fix, get their gutters clean, fix a leak, all things that could cause termites. But, man, I was blown away, you know, after doing this for about a year and a half at how many houses I went to that there was entire sections of the house or in structures in the backyard that were built to cater to men, quote unquote, man caves. You ever heard that term? Yes. It was, it was, I mean, and I would go into some houses where I'm talking like no expenses were spared on the product of producing this man cave, so to speak. I mean, it, it was, and so I, you know, for a while, you I mean, know, first time, you know, walk into a house and there'd be a big screen TV and, you know, in an Xbox in the corner and, the, oh, that's it's my husband's spot. And then they'd go into a place where, and it was an entire room, a movie theater thing. And it's, this is his guy's hangout area. It's a, a whole bar. And then the structures in the back. And so after a while, I was just thinking like, man, what are these guys? These guys are working all week because these are nice houses. And then how much time are they spending with their families when they get home? Right. How much time? How much time? I was thinking like, how much time do they actually have to be in that man cave, so to speak, with this property and the children that I could see that they clearly have. And so what is, but what society's done through the erosion of the authority of men is eroded their responsibility as well. And so it's made men irresponsible. And so now men are conditioned to believe, well, since they're not that important anymore, since I'm not needed for a family to happen, since I'm not needed to lead at church, since I'm not needed to step into my role and father people who are fatherless, I'll just do my own thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? I need my me time. And so they work all week so they could isolate themselves all weekend. And that's the way a lot of people live. 
and it blew me away when I saw it. it was, the evidence was there. And so men have shunned responsibility because they've been demeaned through society. Amen. And so it discourages men on the whole from stepping into their God-given role. Think about Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, the Lord placed man in the Garden of Eden. Who placed him there? The Lord, the Lord placed man in the Garden of Eden. And what did he tell him? To tend and to watch over it. God established the authority and God gave the rules, the command. I want you to tend it and I want you to keep it. He laid out the responsibility chart for the man. Amen. And so it makes perfect sense that the enemy wants to chop the legs off of God's plan. Because once again, if he gets one tire flat, then the whole car is just wobbling, discombobbled from that point on. Right. And the plan starts to thwart or so he thinks. And so men really are called to take responsibility for their homes, communities, leading always in righteousness and in love as protectors and stewards. They're to exercise authority, always with humility and godly wisdom. That's how it's supposed to be done. Amen. And so this is the call of every man, all of us in this place today, guys. We're all called to take responsibility for our homes. That means what happens at our house, good or bad, it's your fault. Yeah. That's just the bottom line. It's your fault. Amen. We have the ability to lead and we have the ability to guide and it always has to be done through righteousness and love as a protector and a steward, constantly exercising authority with humility and godly wisdom. This is why it's important, like I told Victor last night, you got to get into the word, man. You got to find out for yourself how he wants you to live your life. If you're willing to stake your, your career on a book that a man wrote, well, why not your eternity on a book that men wrote? while they're under the influence of the Holy Ghost, amen. He's got some good stuff for us in there, guys, if we'll simply just get into that word and let humility and godly wisdom build our character so we can take our proper space, our proper steps in our homes. Amen, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. Once again, he must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man can't manage his own house, how is he going to take care of the church, amen? Now, like I said, this is kind of a, a good way to, to look and kind of examine how we're leading, you know, is, is the house being managed well? Are the children unruly? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so how many times, and I've been a part of the churches where the pastor's kids were the worst ones in the bunch. Anybody that's ever seen that or am I the only one? Yeah. Some, th that should be a bit of a flag there. You know what I mean? I'm not saying we throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, and we just write him off, but that should really kind of resonate in the lives of all of us. Like, hey, we got there's certain things that should be in an order. Because if we're having trouble managing that, there's chances are it's going to be bumpy when it comes to managing the church. Amen. Next, and we're getting close on time, but I'm going to go a little bit more. Finish this next one. The attack on manhood has really encouraged a, a passivity and a complacency in the lives of men. A passivity and a complacency. And so men are often tempted to fall into passivity by focusing on personal success, entertainment, or comfort rather than actively pursuing godliness and leadership and serving their families and communities. So the attack subtly erodes their God-given call to stand firm with spiritual integrity. And so I'm telling you what, passivity and complacency are rampant in the lives of men these days. Just standing by as the enemy plunders their camp. This is what's happening household after household in every neighborhood that we're, that's why it's so important you know i believe we're big believers in neighborhood churches and we're believing god for this property so we can you know strategically minister to this community because the enemy is on the attack in every single household here to bring in this passivity as men stand idly by and really watch the enemy run roughshod over their family this is happening it's happening nationwide it's happening worldwide amen and so through this attack on manhood men are tempted they, they to fall into this just passive nature, just like, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. You ever hear that saying? And they focus on things like, well, personal success. Well, I'm just going to build my own kingdom. Or entertainment. Once again, the man cave has become a, a staple in most houses. Or just comfort or what about leisure? Leisure is another big deterrent for manhood these days. People working, always working for the weekend, right? Friday can't come fast enough. 
and they they hate Monday mornings. I mean, I know Candace and Anthony understand that walking into Zatarans every Monday, right? Man, they can't wait to get to Friday, and they hate everything about a Monday, living for the comfort or the entertainment of the weekend. Amen. And so what this does is it subtly erodes the, their God-given calling to stand with spiritual integrity, right? Integrity is what happens in our lives when nobody's watching. And so men begin to throw that off. They begin to not care. You could, if you see it or not, hey, it doesn't matter. And so they begin to live openly with, you know, this, in this rebellion against God. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, he says this. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Hold tightly to eternal life to which God has called you which you've declared so well before many witnesses. In the first Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, he says this, be on guard. I'll tell you in a second again, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous and be strong. Now these are given to the church, but I'm applying these specifically to men today. First Timothy chapter six, verse 12 and first Corinthians 16 and 13. Fight the good fight of faith. Now, obviously Paul is talking to Timothy in this verse, who's a young pastor, he's encouraging him you know, as he's in for a fight, amen, fight the good fight of faith. That's the role of men in the house. So that this, this passivity or this, this um, temptation for personal success or, you know, leisure or comfort is totally anti the charge of the man, amen. which is to stand firm and to fight. Amen. And so I love how this isn't conditional upon, praise the Lord, it's not conditional upon our, our size or our muscular build. You know what I mean? I've been this tall, I've been this height since I was 13. <laughs> so, amen. It's not about how big we are in personal stature. It's about how big he is in us, right? And we can do all things through Christ because he gives us the strength. And so if he's given us the command to fight the good fight of faith and to stand firm and be on guard, then we're able to do those things. That means no weapon that's formed against us can ever prosper if we're walking under command of the Lord Jesus and faithfulness, and we're doing it right, if we're doing it hum humble and with a servant attitude, he's gonna fight those battles for us. And so we really have no reason to fear. And so the enemy's mind, mind freaked the culture to somehow think that, you know, if we don't achieve a certain level of success, if we're not, we don't have a certain level of influence, if we don't have a certain level of, of, cre uh, of creature comforts, then we don't have a right. We don't have a, a platform, so to speak. Well, our platform isn't based upon what we've done. It's never been based upon what we've done. It's always been based upon who he is and what he's done. Amen. And so he's called us to fight, to stand firm, to be on guard. Amen. And so scripture warns us against complacency, constantly warns us against complacency, and it really calls men to be vigilant in their spiritual lives. We're called collectively to, quote, fight the good fight of faith and to be, in, and to be courageous and strong in our walk with God. And so these attacks on men, are, they aim to weaken biblical manhood, but God's word is designed to strengthen biblical manhood. It's, that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to teach us how to lead and how to live manly and godly. He says he's given us all things that pertain to godliness through whom? Through Christ Jesus. Amen. And so if we want to get a handle on manhood, <laughs> we want to get a handle on leadership, we want to get a handle on our homes and really learn in our proper place, it's all right here in the word of God. And we can't let the enemy rob us of those things. Amen. And so I'm telling you, I, I mean, I've, I've struggled with it, you know, at a time thinking that somehow, you know, um, I've disqualified my, by myself because of the, the life that I lived in the past or, you know, the enemy sows these things in our lives that, you know, they, you, you've canceled yourself out. Well, no, not what I read. Amen. His blood is faithful. He's faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us if we'll simply confess those things to him and come back under that authoritarian structure. All praise to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I had a lot more, so we're gonna, <laughs> we'll just stretch it on. Amen, yep. We'll, we'll continue down First Peter chapter.